Hi guys, welcome to History and Game. During the small hours of night, a magical moment occurs. A moment unfixed from time and definition. Too late for yesterday, but too early for tomorrow. Now, the subconscious soul passes through, knowing none the wiser, but the conscious soul, for a brief magical moment, transcends existence by neither living in yesterday nor tomorrow. During this magical moment where John Godfrey and his assistant, Ian Fleming, sit in a dim basement at a small circular wooden table, strategically placed dark brown and black area rugs cover the concrete floor. Except for the intermittent passing of traffic, the basement is quiet. Godfrey sits straight and proper, his legs delicately crossed underneath the table. Across the way, Fleming leans heavy into his chair, a lit cigar in his mouth. It is the evening of September 29, 1939, and the dawn of the Second World War. I spent four years of my life at war. A goddamn bloody mess it was. Absolutely dreadful, Godfrey says. Across the table, Fleming is seated in a cloud of thick cigar smoke. I can tell you what, sport, Godfrey continues. On that day back in November, I felt, no, I knew that war would never come again. Especially not to London. Never to London. Godfrey lets out a long and exasperated sigh. A distinct sigh of a disenchanted and disillusioned soul. A symptomatic sigh marking when the harshness of reality destroys the individual's assured belief in hope, dreams, and faith. Godfrey repeats to himself, Never to London. Ian Fleming is from a prominent and affluent London family. His father and mother are members of Parliament and pillars of the community. Unfortunately, the Flemings' wealth and status does not shelter them from the horrors of war. In 1917, Fleming's father is killed by German shellfire in France during the Battle of the Somme. Fleming's interests reside in the privilege of leisure and the art of luxury. Without a father figure, his attitude is often narcissistic and combative. He wastes university money on expensive cars, vacations, and numerous sordid affairs with women. His love of travel, exotic locations, and skiing results in the abandoning of his work as a stockbroker. Despite his lack of success, Admiral John Godfrey recruits Fleming as his personal assistant, giving him the code name 17F. In a quiet basement, Fleming asks, How old are you, Mr. Godfrey, if you don't mind, sir? Uh, no, no worries, old sport. A quick moment passes. Godfrey lifts his head, deep in thought. Well, as they say, I am 51 years young. How long have you been Director of Naval Intelligence, sir? Since April. Less than a year, Godfrey responds. Less than a year, Fleming echoes to himself. Less than a year, and now war with the Nazis is perched on Britain's doorstep. Bugger. Godfrey nods in agreement. Bugger indeed. Fleming sits in the sun outside his estate, clacking away at a typewriter, a burning cigarette resting upon his lips. Originally purchased by Fleming many years prior, in case of a successful Nazi invasion, the estate runs parallel to Jamaica's northern shoreline. Fleming's 15-acre estate proudly stands on a cliff overlooking the beautiful blue and translucent waters of the Caribbean Sea. Fleming sits in front of a silver typewriter, working on his first novel. Despite his limited stay, he resumes his leisurely lifestyle. He grabs a glass, his fifth gin of the afternoon, raises it to his lips, and gulps. Then he grabs a dying cigarette and uses the embers to ignite a fresh one. After a satisfying drag from the new cigarette, Fleming turns his attention to the typewriter. 
A blank white sheet is top-loaded and fed into the silver machine. With the sound of the oncoming waves in the distance, Fleming begins. His fingers move swiftly over the typewriter. The first page sets the scene. The next page introduces and describes the novel's protagonist. Fleming's typing comes to an abrupt stop. Huh. Who is this guy? Fleming says to himself. I need a name. A good one. But nothing comes. He then begins to shout. How can being drunk and writer's block happen at the same time? 3,000 years of beautiful literature from Aesop to Anthony Powell and... Uh, well, well... This is bloody unheard of. He gets up from his chair, knocking it over in the process, grabs his cup of gin, and stomps inside. Inside, the air is cool and dry. In a drunken rage, Fleming slams the screen door, knocks over a small table, and overturns a piece of furniture. Then, gasping for breath, he sets his anger loose on a nearby bookshelf, frantically grabbing books, throwing them over his shoulder and across the room. Suddenly, Fleming's rage dissipates. In his hand is an oversized green and leather-bound book, a book from his childhood. Slowly, he returns to the patio, corrects his chair, and sits. Fleming possessed a strong interest in birds. Even as an adult, he considers himself a keen amateur bird watcher, because in life, some childhood hobbies never die. For Fleming, it was his interest in ornithology. On the cover, in fancy golden lettering, is the title, The Definitive Field Guide to Birds of the West Indies. Underneath the title, in much smaller lettering, is the book's author. Fleming takes a drag from his cigarette and slowly exhales. Yes, absolutely brilliant, Fleming says with a smile, returning to the typewriter. And there, next to the Caribbean Sea, sitting on the patio of what he and his wife call the Golden Eye Estate, is where Fleming slowly and deliberately keys in the name James Bond. Are you sitting down? Are you ready? Because I'm about to wrinkle your brain. Okay then? Life is filled with nevers. Things people will never be able to do or become. The chalk line of limitation. The cathedral-sized obstacle. The perennial void of never. And yet, deep down, there remains a shimmer of hope. Why? Because history is filled with people that, despite all the odds, do what they never should have been able to do, and become who they never should have been able to become. These people, their stories, provide hope. They give a reason to believe that if history repeats itself, then maybe, just maybe, we are next in line. Ian Fleming is a story of nevers. Let me show you. Fleming never should have been a successful writer. As a failed banker, then a failed stockbroker, Fleming never knew the satisfaction of personal success. Fleming never should have finished a single novel. As a heavy smoker and lifelong alcoholic, Fleming knew nothing but a life of excess and indulgence. Fleming never should have been able to publish his work. As an opinionated and outspoken narcissist, Fleming burned bridges faster than he could build them. In the summer of 1952, fully aware of the nevers in his life, Fleming continued working and toiling away at his first novel, Casino Royale. And with a little hard work, a buttload of gin, and a conscious appropriation of an ornithologist, Fleming created a highly successful career and the birth of the James Bond franchise. With 13 novels, seven different actor portrayals, and 26 movies, James Bond continues to be a significant cultural icon. For over 50 years, audiences love, and continue to love, seeing Bond on the big screen. Unfortunately, 
interest in seeing Bond on the page eh, has grown extinct. You see, Fleming was well known for his crass behavior and politically incorrect opinions. His approach to writing fiction wasn't any different. In other words, let's just say Fleming's novels have not aged well. Modern day readers have found Fleming's abundant use of racial slurs, misogynist descriptions of women, and overt homophobia not only disrespectful, but completely unacceptable. So much so that in early 2023, the Bond series was republished with the following disclaimer on the first page. This book was written at a time when terms and attitudes which might be considered offensive by modern readers were commonplace. A number of updates have been made in this edition while keeping as close as possible to the original text and the period in which it is set. Fleming's once successful novels are now ignored and forgotten. For even the road to ruin has its toll gate, even in the afterlife. Spectre, the board game, is a competitive game set within the Bond universe. First, as always, let's get the specs of Spectre out of the way. Spectre is designed for 2 to 4 players, ages 10 and above or 14 and above. There appears to be some contention between the game box and the game website, so, you know, do whatever you want. In Spectre, players take on the role of an iconic villain from the James Bond franchise. During the gameplay, players compete against each other to become the new mastermind in charge of the Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion. Or, for short, Spectre. For this episode, I have simplified things by combining game explanation and review into a single stream of consciousness. So, you know, bear with me. In the words of Mario, okay, here we go. Each round consists of six phases in the following order. 1. Draw a mission card. Mission cards are ridiculously pointless. They needlessly destroy the game's thematically competitive gameplay by introducing a worthless and arbitrary semi-cooperative component. 2. Place Villain and Henchman Pawns How in the blue balls did the creators choose worker placement as the game's primary mechanism without designing the worker and the placement? Seriously. If you make two different types of workers, then your game should enhance worker distinction through utility. Villain pawns are round and henchmen are square. Or the villains are square and the henchmen are round. Whatever. I couldn't care less. Square guys and round guys. They're pretty much the same. Okay, got it. Also, the placement in worker placement means providing players with interesting and meaningful choices. Holy Moses! This is Bush League. 3. Check for Majorities Game Gets Right is the interplay between checking areas in a predetermined order and majority bonuses. What the game gets wrong is that checking for majorities will bore you to death. The majority bonuses are emphatically uninspired. Move an influence from here to there, or from there to here or collect resources for use in some other forgettable part of the game. 4. Resolve Mission Card The useless mission card revealed at the round's beginning is now resolved. Players are forced to work together by blindly bidding resources. If the mission is successful, something happens. If the mission is failed, well, something else happens. Players win and lose with each other. This is to circumvent players from bidding low or nothing. I I get that. I only have two questions. Is any of this thematic? And is any of this needed? 5. Roll 007 Dice Player rolls two six-sided 007 dice. The dice roll determines which player is attacked by the non-playable James Bond, who causes minor player frustration. 
However, the real frustration comes not from James Bond, but the dice. Dice are equally composed of numbers and symbols. This yields countless of dice combinations. Seriously. Every single round, I had to grab the rule book to figure out how to resolve the rolled combination. As time passes, shouldn't players be able to interpret dice resolution on their own? Just a thought. 6. Recover pawns and change numbers. Players return the pointless round and square pawns to their meaningless villain board. Depending on the victory track position, players are assigned and given a numbered rank stand. These stands not only determine player order, but provide unique player powers. Rinse and repeat. Great. Only six more rounds left to go. First off, I want to go on record by saying that there is not, nor has there ever been, a correlation between complexity and entertainment. Can I get a hallelujah? On the plus side, I feel that somewhere underneath all of the mindless complexity is a simple yet decent game. On the negative side, everything about this game is a mess. Mission cards unite the table as a team. The blind bidding forces the team into conflict. If worker placement and area influence create player conflict, then why is the ghost of James Bond mindlessly attacking players? At the start of the game, players are dealt private objectives, like fighting over points wasn't enough. The concurrent use of unique villain powers and rank stand powers only add to the confusion. Ultimately, Spectre, the board game, is far beyond repair. We are living in the golden age of board games. Games like Spectre have shaken, not stirred, my belief in the existence of such a golden age. According to the psychological theory of dynamic interactionism, human development depends upon continuous reciprocal interactions. Interactions turn into experiences, and experiences allow you to grow, to change, to rise above the nevers in life. In today's day and age, you can interact with almost anything. You can interact with the refrigerator. Open the door, and the light inside turns on. Close the door, and the light goes off. You can interact with a game. Play a card, and your opponent is forced to re-roll. Or, you and a friend can take turns, placing tiles and creating something out of nothing. Think, how many people stand in line to demo a board game? How many people stand in front of their refrigerators, opening and closing the doors? Why choose a board game over anything else? Because games are a special kind of magic. Come closer. Let me show you. My name is Andrew Davidson. I hope I have given you something to think about.